The United States Army played a major role in Reconstruction in Texas. By late May 1865, Union troops were beginning to enter the state. Its commanders viewed their duties to ensure a loyal government and protect the rights of freedmen. George Armstrong Custer was in Texas as part of the occupation forces and to prevent a Confederate retrenchment in Mexico. He recommended that the army remain in control of the state until the government was satisfied that a loyal sentiment prevails in at least a majority of the inhabitants. Texans viewed the military's views on freedmen's rights as a disruption to the state's labor and economy. However, the military's ability to institute major change in Texas was limited by a couple of factors. One was that the United States Army was demobilized almost immediately after the war. In Texas, the Army presence in the state went from 51,000 to 3,000 in one year, and many of those who remained were in frontier duties. Another factor was a lack of continuity in Army command in Texas. Between May 1865 and March 1870, command of the troops in the state changed eight times. Another potential threat to Texas's antebellum society was the Freedmen's Bureau. This agency, which the Army oversaw, was concerned with issues surrounding refugees, freedmen, and abandoned land. General Edgar Gregory, an abolitionist, initially ran the Freedmen's Bureau and saw his job as establishing a free labor system. He pressured the freedmen to work on the same lands they worked as slaves but signed contracts to work for wages or shares. Since the freedmen had little to no ability to acquire land, this was one of the few options they had available to them. Tenant farming was therefore a way for white landowners to limit the freedom of former slaves. One Freedmen's Bureau operation that white Texans did not appreciate was in educating freedmen. They saw such efforts as destructive of the social order. They also criticized the Bureau's intervention when its agents believed that black Texans were being treated unfairly. These criticisms, however, were exaggerated. The schools received inadequate funding to educate every freedman. The courts were also inadequate to deal with all of the matters the Bureau had brought before them. Under President Andrew Johnson, the former Confederate states worked to fulfill his requirements before Congress could reconvene in December 1865. Part of the plan for presidential reconstruction was the appointment of a provisional governor, who would then call for a convention to nullify the state's secession ordinance, abolish slavery, repudiate the state's Confederate-era debt, and write a new state constitution. In Texas, Johnson appointed Andrew Jackson Hamilton, and he got to work. A constitutional convention would meet and its membership is a great example of how bad Reconstruction under Johnson could be. For example, one of its members was Orrin Roberts. If the name sounds familiar, Roberts was the chair of Texas's secession convention. He rose to colonel in the Confederate Army. If there's a person who should be excluded from any future Texas government, it is him. Hamilton thus failed to prevent the resurgence of the pre-war power structure. The convention met in February 1866 and a coalition appeared between the moderate Unionists and former secessionists, and the details of the Constitution that came out of it reflected it. The Constitution of 1866 gave former slaves few freedoms and restored the antebellum status quo as closely as possible. It declared the secession ordinance void, not illegal. It failed to do the one thing it was supposed to do, ratify the 13th Amendment. Rather, it merely recognized it. Slavery was not just a system of labor but one of race control. Giving former slaves little to no rights keeps them as close to slavery as possible without violating the 13th Amendment. Black Texans could not vote, hold office, serve as jurors, testify against white people, or attend public schools. It also repudiated the state's Confederate era debt. Finally, it controversially validated all state laws that were passed during the war that did not conflict with the United States Constitution. The 10% plan required that once the new state constitution was adopted, then it would elect new leaders. Texans elected conservative James Throckmorton as governor. He was one of the few who opposed secession, but that did not prevent him from serving the Confederacy, rising to the rank of colonel. He was also the recent Constitutional Convention's president. The new state legislature met in August 1866 to deal with the other requirements of Reconstruction, although this would not happen the way the Republicans thought it would. For example, it refused to ratify the 13th and 14th Amendments. It also passed black codes, 
meant to keep former slaves as close to a state of slavery as legally possible. The new state legislature elected Texas's two U.S. senators, one of whom was Orrin Roberts. Texas was not alone in sending former senior Confederates to Congress. During Reconstruction, six Confederate cabinet members, including its vice president, four generals, and eight colonels, were elected to the U.S. Congress. Now this part of the whole process showed a major weakness within the original plan. Just because you are elected to either House of Congress does not mean that you are entitled to the seat. Rather, upon your arrival, you must present your credentials and then the chamber you are trying to join has the right to approve or reject your joining them. Thus, once these new leaders arrived, they would not be allowed to take their seats. As a result, Texas would not have a U.S. Senator until 1870. The South's post-war political behavior angered Northern voters to the point that the Republicans gained tremendous majorities in both houses of Congress, with veto-proof majorities, Republicans in Congress set out to control Reconstruction. It overrode Andrew Johnson's veto of the Reconstruction Act of 1867, which essentially reset the whole thing and began Congressional Reconstruction. One notable difference between Presidential and Congressional Reconstruction was that in addition to ratifying the 13th Amendment, the state had to ratify the 14th. This amendment, among other things, established birthright citizenship, which would make the freedmen citizens and entitled to rights as such. One of the consequences of doing so would be that if the freedmen had voting rights, they could help establish the Republican Party in power in the South.